What's the best kind of music to listen to when you're fishing? Something catchy. And <laughs> what kind of bear is the most condescending? A panda. I got moans. That means it was a good joke. Now you know why I'm not a comedian, though. Uh, my name is Kevin Crow. I'm the uh, senior pastor at Harvest Ridge. And I want to welcome you. And I want to say, hey, if you're with us, um, want to grab a Bible? Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23. I'm going to spend some time there. Be able to look through the scriptures with us today and hear, uh, follow along. So uh, before we do that... Um, just if you guys over the next couple of weeks want to do us a favor, I realize attendance is a little lower today. You know, we lost our sleep, all that kind of craziness. But um, if you, um, you know, last week we had 422 people in this room in this service, or in this service. And uh, there were, yeah, it was a little crazy. So it, we do have a 9 o'clock a.m. service. and want to invite you if you can and would like to attend the 9 a.m., at least through Easter, you know, free up some space. Because here's what's going to happen. The 26th, we have a friend day. Do you have a friend? Do we have a friend? Well, if you got a friend, invite them to church. Uh, invite them to church. And uh, statistics say, and all the studies say, that if you invite your friend, most personal invitation, they'll come to church with you. Invite them to church. Bring them to church with you. And, uh, and that's the 29th, or 26th for friend day. Then the next week, we have our Easter egg hunt. And the Easter egg hunt, you know, of course, they're going to want to bring their kids back for the Easter egg hunt, right? So they can be here for friend day, and then for the Easter egg hunt, and then you can invite them to Easter, because everybody's got to go to church somewhere on Easter, right? So there you go. You can get them three weeks in a row, and studies uh, reveal that if a person uh, comes three weeks in a row, more likely than that, they'll make that church their home, and they'll step into the next level of discipleship and following Jesus. And that's what we want for all of you, is to follow Jesus with all your heart. So anyway, it's sort of like we planned this, and we did. All right. You ever had a big job and you avoided it? Anybody ever have one of those big jobs and you like totally avoid it? Anybody? All right, all right. Let's see if I can do this appropriate. I'll, I'll switch the illustration because it did first service. My illustration didn't work. Let, let's try this one. Does anybody have that one cabinet that you have that's got all of your plastic bowls in it? <laughs> you know all those plastic resealable things. Y'all, y'all do. I can tell by the laugh. You got the one. What is it about those things? They multiply into chaos, right? And are y'all like me? You just take them and throw them in there and then close the door real hard and hope that they all just stay in there. And then when you do open the door, they fall out. And then eventually you say to yourself, at some point, I've got to clean this. I've got to clean it, right? All right, so y'all identify with what I'm saying. And then what you do is you go in, you open up the door, it all falls out, and then you sort it out, and you put the same sizes together, and, and then you put it back in there, and you look at it, and you're like, ah. Breathe a sigh of relief, right? It, it feels good in that moment, right? What I want to talk to you about today is I want to talk to you about the need that we have to do some cleaning like that, that there are some things that are out of order, and the only way you're going to get some peace in your soul is to take those things that are out of control and put them back into order. And when you put them in order and you put them in the right place, you can have peace in your soul. And then you can, you can you know, reach in there and grab something without the avalanche. All right? So this sermon series is called The Daniel Generation. And we need to understand the setting, so let's go back and do this right. Let's see if I get it right this time. Y'all read what, left to right? Yeah, so, right? Read left to right. So 400 years, Israel was in Egypt. You remember that? 400 years, they were in Egypt. So they became a nation, really, in Egypt. Then they did the 40 years in the wilderness, and then they came. And the next 400 years were spent in the time of the judges, right? 400 years, there were these judges, Gideon, Samson, you know, Jephthah. Don't read that story. That's messed up. And then what happened? What happened? You get to the 400 years of the king. It starts with Saul, and then it goes to David, and then to Solomon. And at the end of Solomon's time, about 100 years into the kingdom, it splits, and it goes Israel one way, 
and Judah the other, and Israel ends about a hundred years later when the Assyrians overrun them. And then all the way here at the end of the kings, when Babylon is going to come in, Babylon comes in, totally destroys the temple, destroys the, uh, the city, takes everybody captive, just puts an end to kingship. There's no more kingships. It's all over with. This period ends here. Right before the ending, there's a good king by the name of Josiah that's raised up. And Josiah is, uh, leads them in a revival that actually prepares Israel to survive during Babylonian captivity. And what we're doing is uh, uh, we're recognizing that there is a need for a revival before the crisis moment so that we can prepare the next generation for what's coming. And you remember that in the 12th year of Josiah's reign, he started cleaning things up. And then in the 13th year, this guy named Jeremiah, the prophet, became the prophet. And he was the prophet that went all through the destruction of Israel and all the way into Babylonian captivity, guiding the people to follow God. There's Jeremiah. Then there was Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego that came out of the reign of, of Josiah. It was out of his revival that those guys were raised up. And one more, it was out of his revival that a hunger for God's word became so powerful that the synagogue system actually developed while they were in Babylonian captivity. And that's the system that actually allowed Jesus to minister all around the countryside every time he went into a town. There was a synagogue, and that all came because one generation, Josiah's generation, decided they would seek God with all their heart. And, and the purpose of this sermon series is to encourage you and I that even though there may be a time of crisis coming, we can be a people that prepare the next generation to thrive even in the middle of the coming crisis. So if we're going to equip the coming generation with what they need to survive the coming captivity, time of captivity, then we need to personally commit to a revival like Josiah and his generation. So today, I'm going to ask you to do something, okay? Uh, anybody ever listen to a sermon and you think, I wish so-and-so would hear this? Anybody ever think that in a sermon? I'm going to ask you not to do that today. This is not about anyone else. I want to talk to you about you today, all right? I want to talk to you about your space, your place, your reaction to God, your reaction, and ask you just to pay attention to you today. Nobody else, just you, all right? Would you stand to your feet in honor of God's Word? We're going to read from Second Chronicles because I liked how this was a little better. By the way, you notice I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. Um, you know... I don't want to become irrelevant. I want to try different stuff, right? Yeah. Do you know what it's called if you keep doing the same thing the same way over and over and over again, you never look at any changes whatsoever? You know what it's called? A rut. And you know what a rut is? It's a grave with both ends kicked out. You're just dead, you're predictable, you're boring. So I, I'm willing to try anything. As a matter of fact, uh, thank you for Jonah Eck and all the team who worked so hard from this new background back here. And Kevin Sowers for the cross. Now, we don't have the lights on. There's a reason we don't have the lights on. It's because it ain't done yet. It's supposed to be done, but we turned it on and it's not done yet. So. But you know what? We're always, we have a predisposition here at Harvest Ridge. We'll do anything short of sin. Especially if it's going to help people experience God. I'll do anything short of sin so that you can experience God. And, and I just want you to know there's a little bit of a mentality I've got, and I want you to have a little bit of it. So we're always willing to try anything to bring you into relationship with God, even if it means that I'm going to read from a version I keep goofing up with because I'm not used to how it reads. All right? All right, here we go. Now, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. And he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And he followed the example of his ancestor David. I love this line right here. He did not turn away from doing what was right. Yeah. Man, I, dear God, make that, make that my, what's said about me, that I don't turn away from doing what is right. Not just I turned away from evil, but I don't turn away from doing what is right. It's one thing to not be bad. It's another thing to be good. <laughs> oh, that's good. That'll preach right there. Somebody needed to hear that today. Now, during the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, while he was what? Young. 
Still young. Come on, you young men and ladies. While you're still young, you can make an impact on the world. You can begin to seek God. What he did, he began. He didn't finish his seeking. He began to seek God of his ancestor David. Then the twelfth year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, Asherah poles, carved idols, and cast images. Father, I pray that today you would add your blessing to your word. Pray that our hearts would be open to what you have to say, that you would speak to us, and that in this space, in this place, we would experience you and follow you as God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Before you're seated today, um, because I find it really hard to give a high five to somebody without smiling at them. So give them a high five, give them a big smile, tell them, man, you're sitting next to the awesomest person today. High five. I'm glad you're with us online. God bless you. It's good to see you. Did somebody not get a high five? If you didn't get a high five, lift your hand up. Come on, somebody give them a high five. All right. Now, there are six dimensions to Josiah's revival. There are six dimensions. And I want to talk about the three. I just want to remember the three that we talked about last week. Then we're going to get into the other three. I've got a couple of minutes for these three. The first thing is Josiah repaired God's house. So the whole revival started when Josiah decided he was going to remember the house of God. And he was going to pay attention to the house of God. In 2 Kings 22, 4 and 5, go to Hilkiah the priest. And have him count the money the gatekeepers have collected from the people. So how can you care about the house and the temple of God? Well, remember last week I asked you to do something. And if you weren't here last week, I'm going to ask you this week, all right? Here's the deal. Um, some of you have never given a penny to Harvest Ridge. You've never given a penny. Never, never. Now listen, I'm going to ask you to give thousands of dollars this week. No, I'm not. <laughs> no. What I'm going to ask you to do is something very, very simple. Would you, $5 a week, would you make a commitment that you will give $5 a week to this local church? You know, it costs thousands of dollars to keep, turn the heat and the lights on and all that kind of stuff. Would you give $5 a week to general fund, not to missions because that's fun. I mean, we get to do that. To general fund as an act of discipline. Here's why. I'm not trying to get money from you because your $250 isn't really going to affect the budget that much. But what it will do is it will affect your attitude. Because Jesus said it is more blessed, not just blessed, it is what? More, more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed. And I want for you to step into the blessing of what it means to be a giver and to start the process of moving towards generosity. You're not going to get there with this one act, but it's the first step in the journey. And I'm inviting you to do it as an act of faith in God and as a witness, because where your treasure is, there your heart is. And I want your heart devoted to Jesus. I don't want your money. I don't want your money. I want your heart. Okay, y'all follow me? All right, second of all, he respected the scriptures. By the way, if you contribute to the house, then your heart's going to be in the house and you're going to want to worship God and be devoted to the house. Second of all, he respected the scriptures. Second um, Kings 22.8, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan, the court separate secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this in just a second, but I, I, I am still amazed. They had church, they, they had a temple, they had a worship, but they had forgotten the word of God. I'm a little amazed that people can do this. That you can go through the religious motions. And my question is, what were they doing? What were they thinking? You go through religious motions, but you aren't even reading the book of God who spoke to you about how to do it? What's the matter with you? Anyway, so you know what I think we should do? I think we should recommit to reading and studying the scriptures. All right. Then the third thing he did is he responded with humility. Responded with humility. 2 Kings 22, 19 says, You were sorry and humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I said against the city and its people. The land would be cursed and become desolate. You tore your clothing in despair and wept before me in repentance. And, and notice what God says when he acted upon the word of God. It says, I indeed i have heard you. God was listening. He wanted to listen. God wants to listen to you. He wants to listen to your prayers. He wants to. He doesn't have to. He wants to. And you know what? When your heart is right before God and you pray, he will hear you. And it says, indeed, I've heard you, says the Lord. So that leads us 
to number four, new ground today. Y'all ready for this? They renewed the covenant. Now, I know I talk about covenant a lot here, but um, I, I have to explain this to you. Here's why. Here's why. I had lunch with a guy today that has his doctorate. He has his master's from an evangelical seminary. He has his doctorate from a Catholic university in England where they paid him to take his doctorate because he's so stinking smart. And we were having lunch together and we were talking. And this is what the guy said to me. He said, because I was talking about covenant. And he, he said that what the average Christian doesn't understand is that the entirety of the New Testament lies upon the foundation of an understanding of covenant. Because covenant was so important to the Jewish mind that it's sort of the foundation upon which everything rests. And when Paul makes statements or, or uh, Jesus makes statements, if you don't understand covenant, you just won't understand the depths of it. So we've talked about covenant. That's one of the things we do in essentials class. But let me tell you again, once again, how you make a covenant. So what you'd do is you'd take an animal, and you'd cut the animal all the way in two. You'd kill it, you'd cut it in two. You'd drag half over here, half over here, and then the two parties that wanted to be in relationship with one another would stand on this side of the animal, and they would vow to do certain things for the other party. I will do this for you, and then they would vow, I will do things for you. And after you finish your vows... Then you walk through the covenant, or you walk through the, uh, the cut apart animal and the blood on the ground, and this is what you were saying by that action. You were saying, if I don't keep my promises to you, well, then I may be dead, make me dead like these animals, and my blood spilled on the ground. Now, that's an understanding of covenant. That's why you don't have sex before marriage, is because there's no vows. In the sight of God, there are no vows. That's but anyway, covenants, covenants, covenants. Lots of talk about covenant. But so what happens is covenant is based upon a vow of loyalty that you will honor the person and you will be in relationship with the person you're making the vows with. So I want you to notice the very first thing that happened because Josiah, he realized that the covenant of God had been broken by the people and they were not in right relationship with God anymore. And because they were not in right relationship with God, God couldn't give them the blessings promised in the book. So what did God say? God said, I have rejected you and I must now punish you because of breaking the covenant. You said, if you break it, may you be dead. So what did Josiah do? Josiah reacted by saying, 2 Kings 23, the king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant of the Lord. He said, we've broken the covenant. We're sorry. We want to reenact the covenant so we can be back in relationship with you. He renewed the covenant in the Lord's pleasance. And he pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll, and all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. So what happened was he renewed the covenant. Josiah and the people, they had already repented of breaking the covenant. When they responded, God said, I've heard you. But they needed to do something because repentance alone was not enough. There needed to be an action and a behavior that went with the repentance. Are y'all following me here? Faith without works is dead. Anybody ever hear that? Huh? So he made pledges in the presence of God, and then they resealed the covenant. So, all right, let me, let me see if I've got this right. Let's say you go buy a car and you finance it through a bank. Do y'all follow me? And you say, I pledge to pay you X amount of dollars per month so, you can, so I can drive this car. Anybody ever done anything like that? All right, so when you do that, what happens if for four months in a row you don't, you ready for this, you don't make your payments? What happens to you? They take your car, right? Are you and you still owe the money. So you're in trouble, all right? You have a car, you've entered into a covenant or agreement, contract is how we would use it in our language. Covenant's a little deeper and stronger because it's more about relationship and loyalty. But you know, your bank wants to have you a relationship with you. The relationship they want from you is you pay them. All right? So you're not paying them. 
and they're going to come take your car, and they're going to break this covenant with you, and you're going to get an extra hit on your credit report. Are y'all following me? Everybody awake here? All right, so what happens? Well, you say, "Uh uh-oh, I have goofed up. You take all the money for those four payments plus the interest and the fees, and you send it to the bank, and what do they do? They say, we love you again. You can continue driving our car, right? Oh, but y'all just described what happens with God whenever we, anybody ever sin? Anybody ever not want to sin and still sin anyway? And you woke up one day and you're like, man, I am a knothead. I did it again. You know, you said, God, I will, I, I pledge you. I will never, ever, ever do that again. Anybody ever said that? And then you did it again, didn't you? Yeah, you broke the covenant. You broke the raw. You broke, you broke even your own relationship with God. And now you feel guilty and it comes time to pray. And what's all your prayers sound like? I'm so sorry. You know what God wants you to do though? You ready for this? You ready? It's one thing for you to repent at his rebuke. It's another thing for you to renew your relationship with him through covenant. Are, are y'all catching me here? So what did they do? They renewed the covenant. They said, okay, God, we have broken, but we want back in good relationship with you. We have repented. We said we're sorry, but we're going to take a step again to renew the covenant. Now, what does this look like? Well, I talked about your car. After you pay the bill, then you can drive the car that the bank still owns. If you have a big fight, anybody ever, your kids ever get in a big fight? Yeah. Did anybody do what I did and I made them hug it out? <laughs> Any other parents like me? Hey, can I say a word about parenting for just a second? Y'all all right with this? Yep. Can I take 30 seconds to talk about parenting? Hey, let me tell you why I want to talk about this. Yesterday at a deacon's meeting, and in our deacon's meeting, they're all men of God and faithful to God. You know, they're the examples to us all. No, they're good guys. They're good guys. All of them are. They're good guys, good dads, good fathers, good husbands. They love God. They're faithful. They're diligent. They're here on a Saturday morning. They're taking care of business to make this church run right. And we started talking about kids. And you know what? Not one single deacon said, I raised my kids right. Oh, they all raised them right, but they didn't raise them right. You know why? Because every single deacon, y'all ready for this? Made mistakes with their kids. Y'all ready? Yep. Their pastor, all of us. Can I say something to you parents real quick, especially if you've got kids in your house? Listen to me, listen to me. You're not going to get it right. You, you, you'll goof up. Don't be so concerned about the rules as you are the relationship behind the rules. You want them to have a right relationship with God. You want them to have a right relationship with you. And you want them to have a right relationship with their world, right? All right. So what if you goof up as long as those goals are accomplished? You're not going to be perfect. Cut yourself a break. And then, y'all ready for this? Maybe you might be able to cut your kids a break. Because here's what I know. Every one of those deacons have great kids. But every one of the dads didn't do it right. Listen to me. Listen to me. Get rid of this guilt, shame thing on you. And love because relationship is the answer. That's what you're shooting for. A relationship with God, a relationship with you, and a relationship with your world that's healthy. And that's what's going on here. God says, yes, you can repent. But it's not enough just to repent up this way. You've got to make it good in every part of your world. All right. So... What does it look like? Your kids have a big fight? Make them hug it out and then go get ice cream. Because you got to celebrate when they get it together, right? Right? You have a big fight with your spouse? Make up and have makeup sex. You know, God designed sex. The celebration of the covenant. God designed that. Y'all ready what for? Y'all ready? To enter back into relationship when things go crazy. If you've been married more than a day, things go crazy. Makeup sex is a declaration that the war has ended. (laughs) If a marriage has been violated, if the vow has been broken, after repentance, there can be a time of restoration and renewing the covenant. And if you've strayed from your faith, After repentance and turning back to God, 
you can re-enter into a covenant of relationship and joy with Him. All right, can we get heavy here for a second? All right, I got to get heavy. There's no, me and my wife, we talked about this. There's no way I can preach this sermon without getting heavy because I have to pay attention to this next passage. So you got your Bibles open. We're going to pay attention to the passage. It's ch- uh, chapter 23, verses 4 through 20. He removed the impurity. They removed the impurity. 2 Kings 23. Then the king instructed Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second rank and the temple gatekeepers to remove from where? Come on, come on, think with me, everybody. Remove from where? This is God's temple. And what are they supposed to remove? All the articles that were used to worship Baal, Asherah, and all the powers of the heavens. Say what? In church? (coughs) Now the king had all these things burned outside Jerusalem, the terraces of the Kidron Valley, and he carried all the ashes away to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests. They'd even appointed idolatrous priests, huh? Mm. Who had been appointed by the previous kings of Judah, for they had offered sacrifices to the pagan shrines throughout Judah and even in the vicinity of Jerusalem. They had offered sacrifices to Baal, to the sun, the moon, the constellations, and the powers of heavens, otherwise known as astrology. By the way, do you know what astrology is? It's something written that's a prophecy that could happen to any person, any time, in any day of their life, anywhere in the world. But you somehow think it's predicting your future. Somebody here is dumb. I don't know. And if you're offended by me calling you dumb by looking at astrology... Well, then I told you today God was going to talk to you in this message, not somebody else. (laughs) The king removed the Asherah pole. You know what an Asherah pole is? We talked about it. Now, I had a picture of an Asherah. I did some Google. Don't Google it, please. I looked up what Asherah was, and I found a picture. And I literally, it is so vulgar, I can't put it on the screen. I couldn't put it on the screen in church. But yet they had it and were worshiping it in the temple of God. Do you know what an Asherah pole is? Big phallic symbol. If you don't know what a phallic symbol, look it up. No, don't. No, don't. <laughs> you might get something you don't want to see. See, I've got to be careful here because... Y'all thought that it was only the 21st century that we were struggling with all this junk. It's not. It's been going on forever. Now, notice this. Uh, The king removed the Asherah pole from the Lord's temple and took it outside Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley, where he burned it. He ground the ashes of the pole to dust, threw the dust over the graves of the people. He also tore down the living quarters of the male and female shrine prostitutes that were inside the temple of the Lord. I don't have time to think about this, but ain't no woman paying for these favors. Just, you can think. What happened was the women wove coverings for the Asherah pole because they saw the picture I saw and it needed to be covered up. (laughs) That was sort of funny. Some of you didn't, what? They were weaving clothing for Asherah, I guess, to cover up. I I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Josiah brought to Jerusalem all the priests who were living in the other towns of Judah. And he also defied, uh, defiled the pagan shrines where they offered sacrifices all the way from Geba to Beersheba, which means from the top to the bottom. He destroyed the shrines at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of Jerusalem. So now we're getting outside of the temple and we're going to the towns. The priests who served the pagan shrines were not allowed to serve at the Lord's altar in Jerusalem, but they were allowed to eat the unleavened bread with the other priests. The king defiled the altar of Topeth in the valley of ben Hinnom, so no one could ever use it to sacrifice a son or daughter in the fire as an offering to Moloch. What was Moloch? Moloch was the prosperity god. And they would kill their kids so they wouldn't ruin their career. 
I'm not sure you guys heard that. They'd kill their kids so it wouldn't interfere with their career. Just saying. He moved the entrance of the Lord's temple and the horse statues. What are the horse statues? We are powerful. We win. Yes. We have armies that are powerful. So worshiping your power and your prowess. That the former kings of Judah dedicated to the sun. They were near the quarters of Nathan, Melech, the eunuch, the officer of the court. The king burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. Josiah tore down the altars. The kings of Judah had built on the palace roof above the outer room of Ahaz. The king destroyed the altars that Manasseh had built <coughs> in the two courtyards of the Lord's temple. He smashed them to bits and scattered the pieces in the Kidron Valley. The king also dedicated, uh, desecrated and the pagan shrines east of Jerusalem to the south of Mount of Corruption where King Solomon of Israel had built shrines for Ashtoreth, the detestable goddess of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the detestable goddess of the Moabites, and for Molech, the vile god of the Ammonites. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles, and he desecrated these places by scattering human bones over them. Finally, he returned to Jerusalem. You know what just happened here? You know what just happened? He called out the idols of the age. First, he called out the sexuality of the age. The sexual impurities and promiscuity of the age. And somehow in America, the highest moral virtues we have in our culture right now is all around sex. And I want to be very, very clear in my explanation here that the highest moral virtue is not how you sexually identify yourself or how you sexually, whatever fulfillment you get. Your highest moral virtue is that your heart and soul and body are devoted to God first and that those things are subjected to His Lordship. Yeah. Second of all, they were sacrificing their children to Molech. And I don't care how you say it, God is pro-life. God is pro-life in the womb. God is pro-life outside the womb. God wants kids to be taken care of, not just born. God wants balance in this for us to be pro-life all the way through because God is. We want to be. And anything that sacrifices children for the sake of your success whether it's working at four to 100 hours a week or aborting a baby yeah. or abandoning a child because you've got to use drugs or alcohol, whatever it is, it is wrong and it needs to be done away with and we need to get back to what God says about life. <laughs> the horse statues, anytime you worship your wealth or power, there's even a portion of Christianity that are, you know, prosperity gospel Christians. Listen, if you're throwing $5 in a plate because you think God's going to give you $500, you're a pagan. You're a pagan. You're trying to manipulate God. God is not to be manipulated. He is to be honored and served and worshiped. And the pagan shrines where people live. Have you compromised with this culture so much by the things you do, the things you say, the things you watch on TV, the things you put in the priority in your house? And there are some of you, as I'm preaching, God is talking to you about things in your life that you have allowed to defile you and Satan is gaining a foothold in your life because you want power and you want riches and you want ease and you want pleasure more than you want God. And if you want any of those things more than God, it is a sin. It will destroy you. It will destroy your household. It will destroy your world. And the way we have to deal with it is to be ruthless just like him and destroy it. God's first. God's first. Well, pastor, that doesn't happen in Christian circles. Oh, really? I just happened to be going through a Christian meme page. Christian meme page. Can you put that up on the screen for me? Chris, best Christian memes post, right? Christian memes. This lady thought it was all right to say, are you in love with someone and they don't reciprocate? So what do you do? No, down there at the bottom. This is totally harmless and has no side effects. The solution? 
called Dr. Victory Astrology, and he will cast a spell on them. My friends, this is witchcraft. It is in opposition to God, and yet some of you think it's all right to look at tarot cards or to play with Ouija boards or whatever it is. Listen, I don't want to be stupid here because God's more powerful than the devil. The problem is, what are you looking for? Can we talk about that for a sec? Now, um, I'm not saying you got to, just listen, God's going to tell you what to do. But how do you know if you're having a trouble? Here, here's how it is. Me and my wife, we drive to Oklahoma occasionally, because that's where I'm from. We drive into Oklahoma, and we're going down the road, and we find a radio station we like, you know? Whatever it is. One day, it was NPR. Another time, it's a Christian station. Sorry, I'm a mess. <laughs> another time, we're listening to 80s rock, you know, because 80s rock is God's music. Yeah, uh, I don't think so, but that's all right. Anyway, so we're driving down the road, and you know, you got a radio station, and as you're driving, and the radio station's really strong, and you keep driving, and what happens to it? Starts going, you know, and, and before long, you keep driving down the road far enough, you know what'll happen? You'll get another station that comes through. Are y'all following me here? All right, this is how you are with your relationship with God and your relationship with the devil and the world. How, how do you know which station you're going to pick up on this frequency, the frequency of your brain, the frequency of your spirit? How do you know what station you're going to pick up? Simple, the one you're driving towards. And, and, and listen to me. I'm concerned that a lot of the church is driving towards the world and we're losing our, our relationship with the voice of God speaking to our hearts. Yes. And it's time for us to turn around, repent, and go back to God. All right. Let's finish up here. What happened? After they got back in right relationship with God, they cleaned up everything. Man, they felt like that drawer, they could open it up and they could find something. They could find a Tupperware with a lid. Yes, they knew what they were looking for. And that's, so what happened then is they restored the celebration. Because once your heart's right with God and you got no more things standing in your way, what do you want to do? You want to party. Now listen, I, am, I, I think the Bible has, I think Christians have given up the proper theology of party. Do you know God likes to party? Y'all didn't know God liked to party? He does. Look at Jesus. Read the Gospels and tell me where most of the miracles happen. Jesus was at a party. And somebody came through the roof. It's too crowded to party. Well, tearing down the roof. Right, anyway, they tear down the roof, dropping somebody down in front of Jesus. He heals them and goes on with the party. And you know, another lady comes in. She pulls out some jar and starts crying on his feet and wiping with her hair and pouring perfume on. Everybody's looking at what's going on. Oh, that's all right. She's forgiven of all of her sins. You know, at a party, we've got healing. We've got forgiveness. We've got all this stuff at a party. You know, God, there's a marriage supper of the lamb for seven years, and it's going to be a buffet with no calories for seven years. Come on, can somebody say God knows how to party? God likes to party. So what happened? Second Kings chapter 23. King Josiah then issued the order to all the people. You must celebrate the Passover of the Lord your God as required in this book of the covenant. You must do what? You must celebrate yes. the Passover. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings. You know what Josiah did? He said, we're right with God. Let's party, man. Yes. That's why we do Harvest Palooza. Why do we throw a party for our community? Because we want to reclaim that being a Christian is a celebration, not a death dirge. Come on, forever he is glorified because he's already won. And we get to celebrate and enjoy it. So when you clean up all the crap in your life, it doesn't stink. When it doesn't stink, you can have some fun. I'm talking about the kind of party you can remember tomorrow. The kind of party you want to remember tomorrow. The kind of party that you can actually enjoy the people you're with because you can see them and hear them. 
The kind of party that you can enjoy life. So what God wants for you and I is to enter into this relationship and party. Some of you aren't there yet. You know why? Because all the way back here at the beginning of the repentance and turning to Him, you haven't done it. So I'm going to ask you, would everybody just bow your heads for a sec? Come on, there's more joy in serving Jesus than you're experiencing because you've never repented and you haven't cleaned up your life. And if you're in this place today, right now, you need to repent and make Jesus your Lord. Today is your day to enter into relationship with him. Do that repentance and make the vow, Jesus, I will serve you. I will serve you. I will follow you. It's your day to say that. And you want to follow Jesus with all your heart. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand real high. I want to pray with you. Yes. There are others? Yes. Yes. Around this room. Right now, Jesus, you hear our repentance and we turn back to you. We repent, we turn to you. We reestablish a relationship and we thank you that you heard the prayer of every person that just lifted their hand. And right now, they're back in relationship with you. Amen. Amen. So you know what we get to do now? Listen, there's some of you, you got to clean some garbage out of your life. You're just messing with the devil. You're messing with the devil the way you think, the excuses you make. You're just messing with the devil and it's messing up your life, all right? And I want to show you what happens. New Testament, this is the same thing, Old Testament, New Testament. It's like Paul knows this stuff. And he wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, this is why you should examine yourselves because we're about to receive communion. And uh, these guys are going to pass communion out in just a second. Don't worry about it. Just wait a second before you do that. Communion. This is why you should examine yourselves before you eat the bread and drink the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. That's why many of you are weak and sick. And some of you, the reason you've got some of the problems in your life are because you're just plain old messing with the devil. You need to do like Josiah, and you just need to go through and clean the house on some of this garbage. You need to quit watching some of this stuff. You need to quit reading some of this stuff. You just need to quit having these conversations. Just get rid of it. Years ago, there was a radio show I used to listen to because I was trying to understand the next generation. The problem was, I started having thoughts in my brain all the time about what they were talking about rather than what I wanted to think about. And you know what I had to do? Y'all ready for this? I had to quit listening to the radio station. You know what happened? A new level of peace came into my mind. I'm not telling you, come on, which direction are you traveling? You want to travel to see how close to the world you can get or do you want to travel to see how close to God you can get? Which direction you're traveling? Now, I ask them to sing this song because I think this song expresses it. We're going to celebrate communion in just a second. And if you don't have an element, these guys will get you one. And we'll celebrate together in just a couple of minutes. Hold your elements and we'll do this together. I'd like you to sing this song with us.